Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting installment of Club Moffat Talks. I am your host. Did that just start recording in the middle of my sentence? I hope not, because I'm not going to re-record it. Um, today, I am joined by our other instruction librarian, Joseph McNeely. Hi. And uh, marketing and outreach coordinator, Allison Atherton. Hi. And would you like to introduce yourself to our guest? Me? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, my name is Jessica Wood. I'm the Executive Managing Director for Backdoor Theater. Hi, sorry, I accidentally took control of the introductions because I'm really tilted from our technical issues that we've had today. But um, would you like to tell us about yourself before we kind of uh, get a little deeper into this? Sure. Do you want like professional Jessica or just like Jessica as a human? <laughs> uh, you can do both if you want, but I, I promise you, since it's summer, professional Chris is out of the building right now. <laughs> Less. Um, well, my, again, my name is Jessica. I work at Backdoor Theater. Outside of that, uh, I'm an animal mom with three cats and a husky. Oh. And uh, those are my responsibilities. So <laughs> live in life. Well, cool. fun stuff. Joe, did you have something to say? I'm sorry. No, not 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 particularly. I mean, just I'm I'm just being amazed at how easily we've just slipped right into the groove here. <laughs> it's incredible, really. Yeah. Uh, well, since we're grooving already, uh, usually whenever we begin these podcasts, we kind of go through uh, what we've been doing with our weeks lately, just kind of things that we've been watching or listening to or just occupying our time with before we kind of delve into the meat of things. So um, who wants to go first? I didn't know if Allison wanted to go first, if she wanted to do her announcement now or if she wants to save it to the end or if she just wants to tell us about what's going on in her life otherwise um I, I guess i can go ahead and do it now uh so for all of the podcast viewers and our lovely guests today i just was gonna go ahead and announce on the podcast that this is going to unfortunately be my last episode i am moving to colorado and so i will be leaving the library i know yeah it's kind of definitely out of nowhere i just had a chance to tell joe and chris off camera but we thought it would go ahead and make sense to tell everyone here since i've been on the podcast for the past couple months but that's what's going on in my life in the next couple weeks i will be moving and driving 11 hours away so stay tuned and hope that i can handle that drive without crying <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, five hours with a toddler and a baby is pretty much undoable. So I, you have my condolences, but yeah, I do have two cats and they will be in the car with me. Luckily, the vet gave me some stuff to kind of help hopefully relax them because my cats do have um, a habit of trying to sync up their meows really, really loudly whenever they're in their cat carriers and they don't stop. When I moved from my hometown to Wichita Falls, which is three hours, I had to bring them. And I'm not kidding. They meowed the entire time, maybe a couple breaks for like five minutes, but they kept it going the entire drive. And it was like torture. Mm -hmm. One, because it sounded awful, but two, because I felt terrible that I couldn't do anything to make them feel better. So hopefully this drive, I will make it through without losing my mind. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I ever told you this story, uh, so I'll tell it to you to you now. Uh, this has okay. been this was a long time ago, like before you were born, long time ago. Uh, I helped my sister move from the DFW area to just outside of Chicago, like the Gary, Indiana area. Um. We were in a U-Haul truck, a big U-Haul truck, uh, and I was supposed to be her relief driver because uh, I was old enough to drive at the time of this story. But um, she ended up doing all of it. Uh, it was more than 20 hours just on the road to do that wow. trip. But it wasn't just her and I in the cab of the car. Um, we had... Uh, a cat in a carrier that was on the floorboard right next to the uh, passenger seat. 
Then we had like a, a sofa cushion that went over the seat and on top of the cat carrier. And that's where her Rottweiler lay. Oh and there God. was me. Then yeah. her two-year-old son was sitting between us and then she was driving. And so we had that going on for 20 plus hours on the road. Mm -hmm. I bet your trip to Colorado will not be as exciting as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I can match that. That definitely seems pretty intense. One of my friends recently moved from like Grapevine to Seattle and they also have two cats mm. and their partner was with them. And they also had like a big U-Haul truck where it was just like the single cab thing. And so they had to go and obviously they couldn't go all the way to Seattle in one day. They would like stop along the way a couple of times, but that trip for them, they told me, yeah, it was pretty exciting. As you said, it gets a little, you know, crazy. Yeah. One of my friends just moved from Shreveport to around the Seattle area with and he has two kids and yeah, he's um the way it sounds, it's that's an experience that one could only describe as being hellish. <laughs> None of it, not a second of it sounded fun, and it took him three days to get there. So I know whenever people are always like, you know, what's the superpower that you would want? You know, like what superpower would you want? When I was younger, I used to always be like, oh, I want like telekinesis, like move things with my mind. But as I've gotten older, I'm like teleportation, like, oh, yeah, no doubt, teleportation. <clears throat> it would be so useful. And also, like, you would get to travel and go places. Alternatively, you could say mm -hmm. flying because then you could also like fly places. But teleportation is just, it's quicker. Like, imagine in my perfect world, it's like a snap and boom. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a caveat. Is it, is it just you teleportation or is it like Goku where if someone touches you, you can teleport them as well? I feel like that should be it because, you know, I yeah. won't be able to take people with. Imagine, you know, like I go, I teleport to Colorado, but then I'm like, all right, see you cats later. Y'all have to figure exactly. out, y'all got to figure yeah. out how to get up here. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, I guess, my big news. <laughs> as for other things doing, because we usually discuss like reading, watching, uh listening that kind of stuff i have started the hit tv show lost so i actually though i want to preface this <clears throat> because i know it just hit netflix i am not one of the people who started it because it showed up on netflix i was already done with season one on hulu then mm. netflix announced that they were adding it to them so I kind of did it at perfect timing because you know when like an old show gets added to Netflix and then everyone is like having discourse about it. So I kind of did it at the perfect time and I didn't even mean to. But other than my move, that's my big news. Watching Lost, you know, I'm finally in on the conversation. Um, before before I um ruin your day with with what you just said, uh, Jessica, oh. if you ever have anything you want to add into this, just just interrupt us. Okay. Just jump right in the middle of it. It's it's totally fine. We'll talk forever. Uh, so just just as a bit of a warning, like okay. if there's anything you want to say, just start talking and we'll all okay. be quiet. Okay. I wasn't yeah. sure what the rules were. So <laughs> there are no rules. That's the problem. Oh. That's why we had to start with the video uh, recording because we were either talking over each other or we were too afraid of like someone else having something to say. So this is this is a formality for all of us, really. Okay. Um, what I will say is that um, I rewatched Loss with uh, with my wife a few years ago, and I I hate the last season less than I did, but I like the overall show way less than I did in general. So interested? To, well, I mean, I guess I I can't hear your take when you're done with it, but um, when you get done with it, send me an email with a thumbs <laughs> up or a thumbs down because I'm I'm interested. It's yeah. There, there aren't a whole lot of people who haven't watched Lost these days and are actually excited to get into it. So that's that's interesting. I am excited to get into it. I'm about, I think I'm like a little less than halfway through the second season. So I'm enjoying it right now. The first season was fun and it ended on a good like little cliffhanger. I was like, yes, I love, I miss when shows used to have good cliffhangers instead of just automatically getting canceled you know, so that was nice. So far, I'm enjoying it. I have heard, though, that people say it goes downhill. But also, you kind of hear that about every show 
you know, like every big show, it's like that went downhill. Last season wasn't good. They didn't know how to conclude it. And I'm just kind of taking from this, maybe as writers, we just never know how to stop talking. We never know how to end <laughs> the story. We don't know how to add a period. Like we don't know how to finish it up. Um, Lost is weird because they had a really good idea for the ending and they blew all of their budget on a practical set. The last season is completely ruined because they had to have this big, like, realistic temple. And by the time they finished, like, building it, they were like, oh, we don't have any money left. <laughs> like, right after they they finished it off. So it's it's weird. There's a, there's a lot of compromise at the end of Lost. Classic, you know. <laughs> I'm very also excited to get in to the season where the season that's like less episodes because it was during the 2008 writer's strike. Mm -hmm. I love when I go back and watch a show that aired during that time, because you can always, it's like a distinct difference in the shows from the writer's strike, because a lot of those shows tried to keep going without their writers and you can tell. So I'm very excited to see what that season's like. They cut out a lot of fluff. That was what was really interesting to me about that season, because it's like eight episodes long as opposed mm -hmm. to like 20 and it's all mm -hmm. the stuff that the writers had finished up. So it's like the beginning, middle and end and none of the character building, whatever stuff that you would normally have in the middle. And it's really weird to see like lost without like, just, we're just going to sit down on the, on the beach and talk for a little bit. It's like plot point to plot point. Things are happening constantly in that season. Yeah. Kind of like the net, like I was saying earlier, like the Netflix shows, I don't mm -hmm. have anything. Obviously I like a lot of them, but sometimes I do get annoyed when something's like only eight episodes and they cut out filler stuff and you don't get to like grow with characters and you just have to only hit the plot points. It can be fun, but also it can be boring. It's like, so uh, you know, the characters make the show a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. get to the what episode? What else are y'all? Oh, oh sorry. Go ahead. go ahead. No, no, it doesn't matter. I was just, I didn't want to hijack it with my <laughs> announcement and with Lost. So I was going to go ahead and ask what everyone else is watching or reading, listening to. Um, none of the above for me. I am a gamer <laughs> at heart, so I'm currently playing uh, Fallout 76. Oh, so, yeah, that's how I spend my evenings after work and on the weekend. Um, oh, yeah. And Did the work. show was the show part of the? Oh, I've I've actually I no, I didn't watch the show, and uh, I've been mainly focused on Call of Duty, and mm. uh, that's just kind of been my let me you know get murdered by 12 year olds for like <laughs> hours every night and it's good. And then um, I just really started to dig these single player games where you're just exploring and doing all the things. And it's a nice way for me to escape reality for a little bit. Um, so I, I want to get into TV shows and I want to find like a book series that I can like really dive into and be really invested in. I just have not found that yet, but I also haven't tried that hard. So it's <laughs> neat. That's very real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. But yeah, I'm yeah. that's all I I do. I I just I work <laughs> and then I go game and then wake up and go to work. So yeah. yeah. That's well it sounds exciting though. Fallout's a fun game. And also now that it does even though you haven't seen the show, it's obviously like when a game gets a show, you know, the fan base just grows which is always exciting, you know, new players, new people talking about it. So that's always fun. Yeah, I've heard nothing but positive things about the show. I just <laughs> haven't had an opportunity to watch it. But yeah. um, if you like New Vegas at all, which Fallout New Vegas is one of my favorite games ever. And that game is like, or the, the, the first season of the TV show is just like, hey, you liked that game, right? Like it, it, it came out 13 years ago. You liked it, right? Here's here's a little more for you. Here's a treat. And I just ate it up. It's mm. yeah. Um, I, I'm not a huge fallout fan, but I loved new Vegas so much. And that, that entire first season was just like, they knew what I was looking for somehow. So it was, it was nice. Yeah. Very cool. I'll have to check it out yeah. at some point. Yeah. So. I, I have never played those games, but I watched the show and I enjoyed it. So mm -hmm. Uh, cool. You don't necessarily have to have played to enjoy the 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 show, but yeah, I thought it was I thought it was a lot of fun. That was the same for me, actually. I've never played the games either, but my boyfriend has, and so he wanted to watch the show. And I think actually the one you were just talking about, New Vegas, I think that's also one of his favorites. 
And so he was like, oh, we have to watch the show. And as someone who's not <laughs> games, I like the show too. I thought it was really fun. And I thought it did a good job at engaging viewers who didn't know the world. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't played New Vegas. I played part of four and then I was like, I'm going to try 76 because I remember whenever Fallout 76 came out, it was just getting poo-pooed on. No one liked it. <laughs> it just got horrible reviews. And I was like, surely it can't be that bad. And it's really not a bad game. The dynamics in yeah. the game is a little bit different, but it's still, I'm finding a lot of enjoyment out of it and putting some hours into it so far. That's I good. respect That's when a game... Important. I respect when a game comes out and it's like, uh, like there's there's a lot of negative discourse around it, and they like the developers really really try to address all those issues because it seems like it's like totally revamped. That's that's yeah. Just- they've they've revamped this one and they're adding like stuff all the time. It's kind of wild that this far along they're still adding things and adding like mm-hmm. groups, which I don't get into, but you know it's just it's kind of cool to see them doing that. Um, Joe. What, what what do you what's up? Um, over the weekend, I finished a couple of uh, books. Uh, my wife and I finished reading the third uh, Wheel of Time book, which was The Dragon Reborn, and uh, then just started reading the fourth one together. Um, and um, I had said that I had been watching the the TV series Black Sails, which is actually a prequel to the story Treasure Island. Well, I finished watching that series and then I actually read Treasure Island uh, because I realized that I had read like bits and pieces of that, but had never actually just read the whole thing as far as I can recall. Um, So now, and now I have. Um, Let's see, there was a a couple of sort of nostalgia related viewings uh, over the weekend. I on purpose rewatched the movie Warcraft, which I had remembered really not liking when it first came out. But I watched it this weekend and I was like, it's not bad. I've seen way worse movies than that, you know? It's like, it was okay. Um, And it's funny, of course, because they have all of the, you know, CGI backdrops and everything for like the places they're going to. And, I'm not a huge gamer, but I've played World of Warcraft a little bit. And so I'd see them going to a place and go, hey, I've been there. I, I know that place, you know. So there there was that. Uh, but also uh, on Netflix, they have the new uh, Beverly Hills Cop movie. Uh, and I had remembered watching the old ones back in the 80s. And I was like, those are fun. I'll watch that. It was okay. I was uh, I was talking to Ryan about it because they, in the trailer it shows that he they've given him a, a a daughter, and they do that kind of stereotype cliche thing where they have a strained relationship and haven't seen each other in a few years. And I was like, really? It's like part of Axel's whole deal is that he's very loyal. He cares about his friends. This is like so. Why would he have that kind of relationship with his daughter? It didn't make sense to me. Um, and then does the theme song come back? All of the all of the all of the best music from the first and maybe second movie is in this one. Okay. Good. Um, and a lot of the original cast is is in it, um, which which was fun and which is really the the thing that made me made me watch it. Um, then the horrifying thing that I discovered over the weekend is is that I heard about. Project 2025, and I read into it, and the only thing that I can come up with about it is is that it's really super un-American, and you cannot trust anyone who supports it. But that's what I did this weekend. Uh, I, I had a long, I had a long and arduous argument with um, my father-in-law about that over this weekend, okay. so I'm not going to talk politics at all. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, that's not a light read, though. Reading that whole thing, isn't it? Like a lot of pages. It there's a there's a bunch to it. I actually the thing that I was looking at originally took me to the website, which has a lot of links in it on a lot of things that they talk about. Um, and there's not any part of it that is not terrifying. Um, 
Yeah. I uh, you you can look at it for yourself. I I also saw just kind of a a highlight real synopsis of it that a friend yeah. posted on Facebook and just that was super super icky and just makes you go Ugh. uh uh yeah. to just just to think that there are people that have that thought process about you know hey i would rather burn down the world than have someone i disagree with have a good day mm -hmm. i mean it's just i i don't understand i don't understand it uh and yeah to, to, to me it's it's really, really unpatriotic and un-American because it's that thing about um, when you say you love a place, but you actively do stuff that shows that you hate everyone that's there and, and everything about it that makes it what it is, then how can your love of it be trusted or considered to be a real thing? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we we could go more into it, but I I I I think I'd I'd, I'd rather I'd rather not. Um, yeah. I don't want to raise my voice about it. <laughs> well, and, and, yeah, yeah, and 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 I don't. Yeah. And I'm I will say, then, oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's gonna say I'm representing my employer, so I can't. I'm well, like, yeah. also why I'm not. <laughs> so yeah, why I'm not saying yeah, a whole the, lot. Well, and 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 there there there's there's a thing there we. We work for an institution in a very conservative state. Uh, and this part of this state is one of the most conservative areas in a conservative state. So for me to come on here and say conservatives are crazy and they all need to be stopped is something as a loyal employee I should not do. But I'm also a person with free speech, and this is an opinion piece. This is an editorial. This does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the institution where I work, but it is how I feel about it. Chris, yes. what have you been viewing? You want to you want to hear about the video games I've been playing? Yes, please. Let's let's move on from this. Let's talk about video games again. Um, <laughs> no. Um, so I've been doing quite a bit lately. Um, I introduced my oldest daughter to Yellow Submarine and she won't stop asking to watch it. And my wife hates the Beatles. So it was kind of, it was a mix between, I just, I like that movie and I like the, the music in that movie. And also I like to annoy my wife sometimes. So, um, so yeah, my daughter's just constantly asking to watch Yellow Submarine. Um, my, my wife's getting driven crazy about it. Um, as an aside, my, um, my soundbar keeps saying that my volume is just lowering automatically constantly. So, um, that'll be fun. Um, I think, I think it just muted itself. That's weird. Um, we, we hear you fine, Chris. Yeah. It's, it's from your, don't worry about it. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so she wants to watch yellow submarine and every time the, the yellow submarine, like trundles across the screen, she'll go, that's a yellow submarine. So that's fun. Um, we watched the new season of The Bear. Um, that show oh. still gives me horrible anxiety, but less anxiety uh, this this season. So that was nice. Um, it had probably my favorite um, yelling match at a uh, a teacher that I think I've ever seen. Which, if you haven't seen that season yet, um, it's 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 worth the buildup that it has um <clears throat> really weird cliffhanger i wasn't expecting it to end where it did um but it's it's definitely i really want to watch the next season of that now um my wife started watching shameless i i watched the first episode i thought it was going to be different and i don't like it <laughs> because it's not what i thought it was going to be um but it's not the show's fault it's it's kind of my fault for going in with the wrong expectation but uh it just the, the marketing totally fails that show and I kind of lost interest in it because of that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we've done lately, but um, my, my youngest daughter won't fall asleep until like midnight at the earliest. Um, she's, she, she'll be eight months 
in three weeks. So I guess you just turned seven months, really. Um, so not a whole lot of time to really do a whole lot that I really want to. But uh, <clears throat> tried to watch the new Godzilla uh, Kong movie. Couldn't really concentrate on it too much. Um, it's really stupid, which is kind of what I've been like after the masterpiece that was Godzilla minus one. It's nice to have a really stupid Godzilla to follow up with it. Um, video games, though, I'm playing through the Elden Ring expansion. Um, uh, two guests ago, there was the comment made that I talk about the same things, um, constantly. Uh, the last time when my when my oldest was born i was talking about literally the, the exact same things uh i was reading one piece and i was playing some video game and now i'm doing it all over again so i'm back to playing elden ring and i'm back to reading manga and it's just gonna happen forever i guess for the rest of my life well at least you're uh, consistent no yeah i mean yeah that's the thing is that <laughs> i have i have comfort items uh so it's it's a lot easier and it's a lot more comfortable to play the same games and read the same manga that I'm used to. Um, but yeah, Elden Ring came out when my when my oldest turned two months, maybe a month and a half. Um, it was like end of February or something like that. So um, now the expansion pack came out and I'm back to playing it again, but I can't really concentrate on it with two kids now. So. Um, I'm just longingly staring at it mostly. Um, I played this new indie game called Bellatro for probably three hours straight while my in-laws were in. Um, it's a poker game with random elements. So like you can you can choose to buy uh, like joker cards and they'll be like anytime you play a spade or anytime you play an ace or something, then your score gets multiplied or or added up in a certain way. And you're constantly trying to like increase your your score because that's going up. Like your antes get bigger and your your blinds get more difficult. Like the blinds at the end of your your round will be like you can't play any cards in um in this one house. You you can only play cards um in a hand of five or whatever. Uh it's just super addictive. It's really, really fun. Um uh, and it's cheap too. It's like 15 bucks on steam so well well worth the the investment i'm like i said like i played for like three hours in one sitting while my in-laws were watching my kids i was like oh like oh i just can turn my brain off now for a little while um and another game called trails through Day daybreak which is the 11th part in a uh long-running japanese rpg series they're all like 80 hour long games um they're they're nightmares to go through um mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and the new season of House of the Dragons out, which also started the year my oldest daughter was born. So yeah, hopefully um this isn't a trend because if it if it continues, I can't live like this. It's okay to do the same things though. I'm sure I'm gonna be yeah. on my deathbed and I'm gonna be talking about how Twilight changed my life. So Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you um, know, like we can continue to talk about our obsessions forever, like who cares even if it means we're talking about the same thing it, like i said earlier like we're consistent like we know yes. what we know what works for us i know what makes me feel good that's it <laughs> i don't need anything else um i oh, know how I, to entertain I, myself yeah. i think i i think i skipped it on my last podcast on on our last podcast but i um i said that i was starting to read through inuyasha mm -hmm. the manga um I I've never had this happen before, but the the official app that I use gave me a "you've read too much, you need to stop for the day" thing. Oh. So I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm just gonna sit here then. Never happened before. Uh, it's like a hundred chapters, so like two thousand pages worth of stuff in one day, and that was great. So wow. I finished Inuyasha. is It's pretty good. I moved on to Yu Gi Oh, which is actually a good manga. I I don't I don't mind it. Um. So I said I don't I don't have a whole lot going on in my life right now, but actually I do because it's just a constant nightmare of trying to keep my mind occupied with other things. Um, so, um, I don't know how to transition from this. Joe, would <laughs> you like to take over, please? Now that we talked about, <laughs> okay. So, Jessica, you mentioned at the top of the podcast that you are the executive managing director at Backdoor Theater. 
Uh, what does that mean? What do you do in that capacity? Oh, uh, everything, if that can uh, be vague <laughs> enough. Um, it's basically like what an executive director does in the theater world. An executive managing director is a thing. I am newer to the theater world. I did not grow up doing theater, so... I've learned a lot over the last however many years I've been involved with Backdoor, um, but I oversee the staff. I do the marketing. I'm working on the program for Cinderella. So got that stuff. I do the financial part of it, write grants, do the QuickBooks, uh, oversee volunteer retention and training and coordination for front of house, um, put a lot of procedures and policies together and type a lot. So <laughs> that's... I don't know. I do. I do all the things, but I also have an amazing staff that is capable of doing their jobs. So it's been fantastic to to have that here and they can do what they what they are best at and let me worry and panic and have anxiety 24 <laughs> seven, but it's fine. <laughs> so I don't know if that uh, answered the question or not. You no, know, it, 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 it does. Um, and you've been in that position for a year. Kind of. Um I was hired on in August of 2020 as the business manager or interim business manager. And then I was promoted last July. So yes, a year, that's what math is, uh, to executive <laughs> managing director. So what, uh, what kind of challenges have you faced in this first year in the position? Man, that's a great question. Um, Allison came up with it. I just asked it. Yeah. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> um, I would say, Oh man, the biggest challenge I've had in this year, um, gosh, it really, I'm knocking on all the wood. It has not been that wild. Uh, the couple of years before that, absolutely wild. Uh, we closed, backdoor closed in March of 2020 due to COVID. And then July of that year, our dinner stage flooded. So, and then I was hired in August. <laughs> so I was wow. able to intercept the theater with my cohort at the time, Carter, uh, to figure out the flood stuff, the rebuild, and basically just kind of start over, not all the way over because we still had the main stage, but for over a year, we were completely inoperable. And in 2021, we were able to do some shows on the, on the main stage. And then 2022, it was just the main stage that we used. And then last May, we finally were able to reopen the dinner stage. So it's been wild, but knock on wood, the last year has like, it's been cool. It's been like flowing and we're finally getting back into the groove of this iteration of backdoor theater. So. So have you had any moments where like implementing changes or anything where you're like, let's just, let's keep things the way they are here. And then on the other hand, having moments where you're like, okay, well, we're already having to like reorganize and think of new things like are there are there any big differences where you just wanted to move on from some things and just really wanted to hang on to like some more traditions that's a good question because backdoor has been around for over 50 years so there are some die some diehards some ogs that are very still very traditional in theater which i can appreciate we also have to take a look at the theater world as it is today and that it is different and we have to stay with those trends of theater and we also have to educate our audiences that it's okay to see shows that you don't know or shows that may come with warnings you know because back in and joe joseph i don't know what you prefer you may be able to chime in on some of this with your experience with theater here uh but you know back in backdoors heyday they were knocking out you know 12 shows a season or more and at that time you know backdoor theater and theater in general it was entertainment this is what you would get it's your social time it's your time to get together and get dressed up and go do something and now you can sit and watch everything on this for 20 bucks a month, you can watch Broadway HD from home. So it's really, we're competing with technology and we're competing with, um, in the entertainment world, of uh, being able to sit at home and watch Netflix or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus, whatever, versus the thrill that you get from watching something live. Like, and it's so, it's almost untapped now because everybody sits at home. I, if I play video games, like I'm at home, doing that versus, I mean, granted, I do see theater now, but it's much easier to sit at home versus getting out and going and da-da-da-da-da. So 
I uh, I don't know what your question was, <laughs> but um, it's di it's different. It's different now. Theater is different. Oh, okay. Back to your original question. So far, the staff and the board have been on board with ideas that we've had collectively. I'm really big on the staff, especially because we are so small. There's six of us total, three full-time and three part-time staff is we are all in this together, not to quote High School Musical, but, it, uh, but <laughs> no, that's are, appropriate, I think. Yeah, exactly. But we are in this together and the theater world is different. It is, she built different. It's seven days a week. A lot of times we work our regular nine to five, but then we have rehearsals in the evenings. We're working over and working with volunteer time and they're available in the evenings or the weekends. So it's a lot, it's a lot. And I'm very, very grateful that the board of directors and our staff are, we understand it's it's time, you know, whenever all hands on deck for tech week, like now we, we know we got to get in, we're going to put in 50 hours plus this week, plus performances and things like that. But there's some payoff, you know, we'll have blackout dates uh, once a quarter where there's no one at the theater where we are taking that time off and away because self-care is so important, especially in today's world. And we, we're just built for success right now and we're trying to leave back door better than we found it and we can't do that if we're burnout not wanting to be here not wanting to you know do our jobs so they long story short they've been down to clown for with ideas and <laughs> things that we've brought to the table and um, our audiences have been on board with that stuff too so cool that's awesome to hear yeah yeah that's exciting to know that most of like all of the changes, the things that you've been doing, uh, just speaking from like the marketing perspective, because you said you, you know, you have, you put your, you know, doing that for backdoor as well. That is kind of what a lot of things are today, you know, fighting technology, like that's kind of like your competitor. I would even say, I know it's 2024 now, but I would say you're even competing with things like the pandemic too. A lot of people got used to lifestyles of being at home or some people still, even though it's three years from 2020 now, like some people still feel, you know, scared or, you know, for whatever reason, someone might be immunocompromised and they're like, I don't want to risk these things. So, you know, you're fighting that stuff too, trying to, you know, get people to feel comfortable enough to even come and like, even cause like, like you said, they could watch on their phone or they could come out and do this and, there's just a lot of different factors. So it's great that so many people there have been on board with changing things, you know, being innovative, trying different stuff. Cause I mean, theater's creative, like the whole business is just like being creative, entertaining, having fun. So it's good to know that everyone wants to do that too. Yeah. Cause you know, theater was deemed non-essential during COVID and that mm -hmm. really as a whole has greatly, greatly impacted the theater world. Uh, theaters are closing still to this day because mm -hmm. they haven't been able to recoup. Um, even as a nonprofit theater, we still have to make money. We still have to make a profit to exist. And we're lucky that we get to apply for grants and receive donations. And um, but it's still it's still it's been tough. And we actually raised our prices this season for the first time in a long time. I don't know how long, but in my time with Backdoor, I've been volunteering since 2015 the prices hadn't changed, but it just, it's reflecting the cost of productions. Um, looking at this season alone, we're expecting to spend around $40,000 on just production expenses, which is just the rights to do the show, the set, the costume, the directors. Uh, it, it, it adds up very, very quickly, <laughs> very quickly. Oh, and wow. so our ticket prices usually cover the cost of the production. And if we profit, you know, $2,000 on a show, that's great, but that's gone with the uh, electric bill, you know? So it's 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 been a lot to recoup from COVID and reinstating and re-educating the, the value of what community theater brings to our area and just re-educating our patrons and our community alike. I also talk a lot, so y'all feel free to jump in at any time. <laughs> uh, like once I get on a soapbox, I'm going. <laughs> But, I was wondering, did did um did the theater receive relief funds from uh just just the government stimulus? Yeah, so we did the PPP okay. stuff, and then we also got a SVOG, a Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, which was fantastic, and we were able to basically stay alive because of that. And then we also um, had an idle loan, which we just paid off, 
And then we just recently, a part of the flood stuff and the dinner stage rebuild, we worked with the historic commission to do the tax credits. And so that is, we finally got that those dollars uh, last month or in May. So it's it's finally, that chapter is done. We can close her and, and tuck her away. Um, but yeah, so we were, we were able, long story short, yes, we were able to, to get some, some funding and some financial assistance, but we also had our community that came out and donated big for um, post flood. You know, we had one donor, an anonymous donor that gave $50,000 to help with the rebuild. Yeah. When I was on the phone with them and they're like, Hey, we want to give, you know, you know, a sizable check. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like 10, 15,000. And they said 15, <laughs> who what <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. you know and it's just there's people in this community that backdoor has impacted in such a way where they want it to continue for another 50 years and it's really it sounds super cheesy but it really is an honor to to be in at backdoor theater right now you know and excited to see where it goes from here it can only get better so yeah that kind of almost seems like um only I'm only saying this because you said it's cheesy. I think that that's very sweet and great that people want to give back to the community, but it's kind of like almost like a hallmark scene, you know, where like the generous anonymous donor donates to the local thing to keep yeah. the community theater up and running. And it is cheesy, but like, it's a great story. It's heartwarming. Like everyone's happy in the end and backdoor has, you know, positively impacted a lot of people. And so it's great that someone sees that and wanted to help keep it open. Yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of wild to really sit and think about 50 years of history and how many people have walked into this building as a patron, as a volunteer, their first time ever on stage, or uh, Chance, our artistic and technical director, his story, he came and saw Summer Youth Musical and decided he wanted to be in it, and now he's got a, a career of 30 plus years in the entertainment industry. And it's just, it's really, really wild to sit back um, and think about just the number of people that have been here. At, during Backdoor's Prime, they would see about 20,000 people a year, patron-wise. Now we're at like maybe 6,000, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's different, it's different. It is kind of like a Hallmark movie. Oh my God. It's so, it's so fantastic. It's so fantastic. And then I get to have a, picture of a random cat, like can't get any better than this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's perfect who doesn't want to live in a hallmark movie i mean we'll make people make jokes about it and stuff but i would die to live in a christmas town where everyone just loves christmas all the time Fucking <laughs> spice, like done done I'm, I'm a mid-30s male i'm automatically the villain of every hallmark movie. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. no, no thanks that's okay <laughs> <laughs> or it could it could be either of us we could be like the the big city woman who's in her corporate career job and she's just so mean because she likes working <laughs> she's got to go take care of grandma's farm because grandma died and left her this farm and she's used to living in new york city you know yeah whatever I she's gonna get... find out though yeah the, that the city life is not so bad it's not that you can bad. get into the the arts and all the the other mm -hmm. I don't know. And then she can turn no, then she can turn <laughs> grandma's farm into a community theater for the town. Yes. <laughs> you know? What happens to the animals? What uh they we're become part of the production. Oh, yeah. oh, of course. Creativity 24-7. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or we could do Noah's Ark. Yes. You know? Annie, there's oh. a dog. We can add other animals. I would that's a dream. I would love to have some show that we do where there's like a live animal. Because mm -hmm. one thing that we like to do is partner with nonprofits, other nonprofits for our shows to do donation drives and thing and things like that for them. And it would just be fantastic to do something with the Humane Society or pets and have like an an oh god, I'm an animal lover. So I would just be dying in the best way. Uh, uh, about 20 years ago uh at the community theater that's down the road from you mm -hmm. uh uh we we did peter pan and we had a live saint bernard uh <gasps> in the production oh my uh, god yeah adorable oh that's did fantastic. you have her in a nanny outfit though no no <laughs> uh part of the part of the reason for that is that um it was not the that production was not the like Disney Junior production 
uh, of the show. It was a script that was written by the director uh, from the source material. And uh, the there was a bigger separation between what happened in London and what happened in Neverland. Uh, and so there was less fantastical elements in the, you know, what happened in London. So the, the dog was just a dog. Yeah. Um, that actually brings me to a question that I wanted to, to ask you, Jessica. Um, do you, when do you see, like, whenever you're doing these bigger known works, like you're doing Cinderella now, Joe's talking about um, having done Peter Pan. Are there challenges or maybe even beyond that, are there expectations you find that the audience is going to want with producing a, a much major known work? Like, like you're really wanting like the audience wants or needs to see this one thing happen and it's just not in your plan or you want to um, turn it on its head or head or something like that, or maybe Absolutely. just. Absolutely. Yeah, there absolutely is. Um, this version of Cinderella that we're doing is the Enchanted version, which is based on the uh, Brandy and Whitney Houston teleplay. Mm. Fantastic. Um, and mm. so we have to explain that to our patrons in the synopsis that it's not going to be the OG Cinderella that you remember watching as the cartoon or the black and white movie when it was on TV in the 50s or 60s. Um, but there definitely is an expectation if we do more well-known shows that, or especially if there's a show that's been a movie, mm. which has been way easier to access, um, like Chicago or something, there's definitely an expectation there. And one thing that Backdoor prides itself on is doing shows that people don't know, or they may not be as well-known. Um, because that just fits our mission better. Like this season that we have, aside from Cinderella, most of the shows people don't really know, um, unless you're like a big theater buff. Uh, we had Church and State earlier this year, which most people didn't know. Marjorie Prime, which is a newer show. Cinderella, of course. Uh, the Grown Ups was written in 2020, I believe. So that's a newer show. Fun Home is a Tony Award winning show. But that we can, we can talk about um, just content wise. People get your comment earlier about being in a conservative area, Fun Home, deals with homosexuality and but with men and women. And so that's based on the the, on the graphic novel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, interesting. Okay, yes. And then we're wrapping the season up with uh, a good old fashioned redneck country Christmas, the musical, which is exactly what it sounds <laughs> like. So we're wrapping it up like with some happy stuff at the end. But this season is a little heavier, and I think that's really exciting for Backdoor Theater to be able to do. Is and we have. To me, this season is teaching our patrons that it's okay to, sh to see shows you don't know. Like, it's okay. Because you never know your favorite show until you see it. And so that's what, you know, we get to do. And we get the honor of doing these shows that people don't really know that well. So then we can kind of set a standard. But then there is, if you've done shows in the past, you know, there is a standard that's that's set by not just your patrons, but also the people that were in it. And so they may have the same expectation moving forward when you may have a different director or, you know, budgets change or whatever. So there is, it is something to, to consider whenever choosing a season is, do you want to try to like do what Broadway did? You know, we can't financially do that. Uh, we don't got a million dollars just hanging around for one show. Uh, but it's also coming to a mutual understanding with the patrons and with our audiences that like, you know what, this is community theater and it's really high quality and it's not, it's, it doesn't suck. It's really, really good. And we've got really talented people here. So come see it. I don't know all the things. Yeah. And for the people in the show, I'm sure it's like cool and exciting to do things that are different, especially as like actors or even doing like production and directing. Cause it's something new like if maybe they haven't heard of those shows or maybe they have but they've never actually acted in that before or they maybe haven't even read through the mm -hmm. whole thing before so it's kind of like a challenge and getting to do something fun different playful for all of the people involved and like you said too it kind of for back door it makes you stand out like you know that you're doing some different things like you're a community theater you're here for the town for the locals and you're doing some different stuff that people might not know so I think that makes you stand out well thank you it it that's kind of been backdoors thing is that they've always done shows that are a little more controversial or kind of toe the line a little bit and 
And that's okay. Cause we also need things like Wichita theater, which have like more of the Disney stuff and the family friendly stuff. Like we, we have to have both. And then there's MSU's theater department. Like we've got to have all these different facets because backdoor does not have the capacity to do it all. Uh, that would be, that's where I would, that would be a challenge uh, if I had to choose something to do it all. Um, but it is, and, it, and also like part, every, every show that we do, our volunteers, you know, they get to learn different facets, not just on stage, but they get to help, you know, design lights or sound or run one of the lighter sound boards or microphones or stage manage. Like there's so many opportunities that are just not on stage. And we want all of our volunteers to end a production, a more well-rounded actor, a more well-rounded volunteer that understands and respects theater. You know, we, uh, we care about the art of theater and that's what we focus on. And I think that it speaks in our seasons and the shows that we do, so. Is it more difficult to get your uh, volunteers to come in to audition for less well-known productions? Surprisingly not. Um, this season, we have had better audition numbers than we've had in the last couple of years. I mean, aside from COVID, which was zero. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think people, the acting community is really excited to do shows they don't know and shows that may be challenging to them, maybe as an actor or maybe their personal perceptions or understandings of theater. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's exciting. It's so cool to sit back and see uh, for grownups, we had over 25 people audition for a five person show, hmm. which is kind of unheard of for a show that nobody knows that, you know, it's about camp counselors, which I don't know, looking around, there's not really summer camps here in Wichita Falls. <laughs> so there may not be a whole lot of personal experience with that, but it's, it's really cool to sit back and watch. And then just to see the talent here is wild. It's, and I Obviously, I'm very biased <laughs> when saying this, but it really is fascinating to to see the uh, volunteers of all ages, from kids up to you know we have people in their 70s and 80s that still act with us, and just they're just so talented, so talented. Do you uh, have any um, tips or tricks? Sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to cut you off. I was I, just going to ask I, I, if you have any I, tips. For people who are wanting to start acting or, like you said, just volunteer, whether that's directing, stage design, acting, whatever it is. Uh, just do it. I know. And it's it's real scary. I I am not a very experienced actor. I hate auditions because I hate reading out loud. Like I'm terrible at it. I suck at it. It's I am sweating just thinking about it. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it's putting yourself in those really hard situations and just doing it youtube i mean it's a catch-22 with the, the technology but youtube there's so many resources online and i always suggest and recommend um we host once or twice a year an improv workshop um that's one of our fundraisers that we do is an evening of improv a couple of times a year and improv for me has been the most life-changing uh thing that i've been a part of because it teaches you that it's okay to fail because you're going to, we are all going to fail. We're all going to mess up, but it'll be okay. It, the building will not burn down, God, knock on wood, uh, <laughs> but you know, it's going to be okay. If you get up to do an audition or you're in a performance and you mess up a line or something, it's, it's okay. Um, and outside of that tips and tricks, oh, you can contact Chance, our artistic director uh, at 940-5000. <laughs> and he can definitely fill you in on some more uh, more tips and tricks, but we also have like our youth education programming for kindergarten to 12th graders uh, to get them more invested in the arts and more invested in theater. And then, yeah, I would just go back to just, just do it. Just ask. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, my first probably year in the office, I just asked a, any theater question that came to mind. I just asked it because I, you don't know what you don't know. And nobody knows everything. You can fake it till you make it and pretend or say, you know what? I don't know, but I'll find out. And then we can all learn. So that's my that's my spiel. <laughs> well, Jessica, um, I, I hate to say it, but um, we've been on for about an hour and we don't want to keep you all day. So um, if there was anything else you want to say uh, or talk about before we kind of sign off, uh, I want to give you plenty of time that you can... Uh, 
add that on. I mean, I'll really quickly, just we're on the social medias or on Instagram and Facebook. Backdoortheater.org is our website. Um, come hang out, come volunteer, come experience Backdoor Theater as a patron, you know, in whatever way possible. But I wanted to ask Joe about his experience with Backdoor Theater, because I know there's some connections here for you. <laughs> uh, I, I did not start doing theater with Backdoor until the early 80s. Uh, my first show, I was in the chorus for Music Man in 82. Uh, but, uh, and they, they were already in your present location uh, in, the, in the old house, ice house there on uh, Indiana. Um, but um, I had seen uh, a show in their original location where they got the name back door. Um, in the 70s, I saw their production of The Sunshine Boys. And I wish I could remember for sure which two actors were in that production because um, it, there are two, two main men and, and, and in that production. And the, I have three names that go with those two men. Yes. Yeah. It, it was, uh, and it, it was some combination of these three men, uh, Bob Arnold, Bob King, or Gare Brundage. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, exactly where my, you know, my mind went. Oh, yeah. uh, and it was, I mean, I was a child at that time, but it was the most amazing live performance I'd ever seen. Mm. And uh, we moved away from Wichita Falls and came back uh, a couple of years later. And at that time, they'd already moved to the Indiana location. Uh, and we saw the 1982 summer youth musical uh oliver uh with richie affinato who went on to broadway because he was amazing um but that show with its young cast and tremendous production value really made me want to do theater um and not just the theater but the to do it there, to do it at, at back door. So um, my brother and I both uh, were in Music Man uh, in 82, and uh, he had a larger role than I did. He was one of the people in the uh, barbershop quartet in that production. And Love. he was actually the understudy for the guy that uh, was the, the lead. Uh, and then... The next thing that we did also together uh, early the next year was Lion in Winter. Mm. Uh, and I was just part of the stage crew for that. And then, um, he, and he played uh, uh, the, the King of France in that, which is mostly about, you know, uh, England. Uh, there, there, was, uh, there was some amazing stuff that happened with Lion in Winter because uh, we did a lot of um, makeup for uh, aging effects for that. And there was like a whole thing in the Times Record News about the the makeup and costuming for that show. And uh, one of the people that was in it made the swords that we were using in the production. And yeah. so there was a thing about that and just stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of publicity for, for that show. Uh, and then after that, I did a couple of summer youth musicals myself. I did, uh, Wizard of Oz and Greece in the next couple of years after that, and then other things since then, and and then uh, and then you know marriage and children and 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 diversifying interests and and lower levels of time and energy have pretty well caused me to to not really do theater anymore. But um, but well, yeah, we'd love to have you back whenever you're ready. Well, and and I, I have to say that Backdoor is very much responsible for the way that I feel about theater. Okay. Uh, several okay. years, several years thing. back, there was a, a thing about um, uh, Bob King and Bren Bristol were there uh, at, for kind of a reunion, and they were very much the directors that I had grown up under, uh, and I had to. I very specifically went to that function, to that event, 
so that I could go to them and shake their hand and thank them for teaching me how to be a theater director and teaching me what it meant to be in theater. Yeah. Uh, and they were both very nice about it. But um, uh, yeah, no, it's 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 an incredible thing. And it is, it is community theater. And so it needs to have the support of the community. So everyone go down and see a show or volunteer, please yeah. volunteer. Cause there's so much things, there's so many things to do other than be on stage. There's yeah. so much behind the scenes stuff. And, 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 and uh, ushers and, you know, ticket takers and all aspects. Yeah. Uh, you don't necessarily have to tread the boards to be part of it. No, and that's, and that's the thing too, is Backdoor only has the six staff members and everyone you see on stage and backstage and in the tech booth, they're all volunteers. So they've invested uh, over a hundred hours of volunteer time for a production to basically raise money for Backdoor Theater. So it's really... It's really fantastic. And I'm so excited to hear your story and how your passion for theater started at Backdoor. Like that is just wild to me in the best way possible. Oh, it's so, so cool to be able to carry on that legacy and for another 50 years. Yeah. Fingers crossed. So. Okay. That is that is really wonderful. I, I, I always have a, a fondness for those kind of things. Like this is the one thing that led me into the field and for it to be something that's still around and still thriving that's that's just really special yeah it's 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 really what like i said it's really wild to sit and think about 50 years of those similar experiences that you've had joe just people that have walked in these doors and it's changed the trajectory of their life i don't know if you ever met kermit fraser yes yeah so kermit I think was here with the bass and had never done theater and he came into back doors a volunteer and now he's a playwright in New York City and has had shows off Broadway like that he's done and it's just wild that he walked into a place in Wichita Falls, Texas and it just changed the trajectory of his life. It's fascinating. It's really really cool. Um I I never got to do a production with him but I had I have met him. Uh and and yeah just uh it's it's a funny thing, and in some ways, it's kind of that that you know brush with greatness because there are people that maybe got their start at back door that you've seen on the movie screen, you know, because they were in the last picture show or you know, uh, 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 Major League Two, depending yeah. on who you know, and, and 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 both of those movies have people from back door in them, uh, so you know. Uh, it's, it is neat. It's, it's very cool that, that you, you touch the stage, you touch the stars, you know? I'm writing yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it Sound also goes to show just like how important community theater is. Like how many times have you watched an interview with a celebrity and someone's asking them like, oh, what got you into acting? And then they say, oh, I did high school theater or I joined my local community production. And then they turn out to be some big star or even not a big star, but like in, you know, Hollywood or the entertainment industry, like Backdoor is one community theater here, which is doing great things, but there's community theater everywhere. And I think all of it's important and it fosters a lot of creativity for people who also might not like I went to a small high school and there we didn't have like theater or any arts programs. And I'm sure there's other schools like that where people can go somewhere local or like come to the closest town to them and join a production like at Backdoor. So what community theater is doing is important. Thank you. Thank you. And I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on that note, speaking of community theater, um, Joe, do you have any lists of what the theater might be putting on? We already talked about it before, but um, or anything else going on in the community right now? Well, of course, obviously, Backdoor Theater is doing Cinderella. It's this year's summer youth musical. And for more information about that, you can contact them at 322-5000. Um, the Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas is hosting a weaving workshop from 5.30 to 7 on Thursday, July 11th, and from 2 to 4 on Saturday, July 13th. Uh, space is limited, but the workshops are free and supplies are provided. 
Uh, the Wichita Theater has just this weekend to go for performances of Shrek the Musical. And Stage 2 Dinner Theater is performing The Odd Couple. Uh, downtown Wichita Falls is hosting the After Hours Art Walk for July this Thursday, uh, the 11th. And then the one in August will be the very first of August, August 1st. Looking ahead to the fall semester here, uh, Rooftop Heroes, a pop culture mini convention celebrating fictional heroes in all their forms, is returning for its second year at Moffat Library on Thursday, October 31st. Uh, we will have speakers and presentations all afternoon and a costume contest to close out the event. Uh, we'll have a vendor area with student organization fundraisers and campus artists will display their work in an artist's row. Uh, for more information on participation, you can call 940-397-4091 or email joseph.mcneely at msutexas.edu. Uh, and then a little bit later in the fall, Moffitt Library will be celebrating Children's Book Week with daily readings Monday, November 4th through Sunday, November 10th. Then for more information about any of those things that I mentioned today and other local activities, you can check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events. And of course, if you have an event you'd like us to announce or if you have any comments or questions or suggestions for one or all of us, please send an email to library at msutexas.edu. We're still waiting on those corrections. Yeah. We will re we will read them on the podcast if you want to give us corrections. Um we won't say whether or not you're right or not, but we will read them. Yeah. All right. And I think that'll do it for us. Uh Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Allison, thank you for just being here and brightening up the place with your presence and doing so many wonderful things out with uh, displays and everything else that you do out here for us. Um, we're you. sure going to miss you, but we certainly hope the best for you and that everything goes okay with your move. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right, and maybe we can have you back on as a guest like a year from now or something just to kind of check in and go, this is how my life is wonderful now. <laughs> this yeah, is how absolutely. my life improved leaving Wichita Falls. I just want to know if your cats made it. That's all. It's yeah. Kidding. Well, I also have to update. I'll have to update Chris on loss, you know. Yeah, please do. Yeah. So in a year, we'll reconvene and I'll we'll discover all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put well, it on the calendar. Good. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, that sounds wonderful. Uh, so from all of us here at uh, MSU Texas at Moffitt Library, thank you so much for listening. And we will see you again on the next one. Thank you.